This is Visitor's Book and I'm Maya, your host. In this program, we're going to be meeting with diplomats and foreigners who are here in Pakistan, and we're going to find out what they really think about the country. So let's go. So today we're here in Saidpur village, and we're here to meet with the UN resident coordinator, Knut Osbu, and his wife, Anne. So let's go find them. Hello. Hi. So nice to meet nice you. To meet Hello. Hi. Hi. Thank you. So, this is not the first time you've been to Pakistan. When and how did you first get here? Well, I came here first in October 1992. Okay. And uh, then I worked for the Afghanistan program, moving in and out of Afghanistan. So interesting. Uh, but because Afghanistan was a non-family duty station at mm. that time, the family stayed behind in, in Norway and they came later in uh, 93. We yeah. came a year later with a newborn baby, a one-year-old and a seven-year-old. <laughs> okay, so almost the same time you've been here also. Yeah, he came about a year before. Okay, I see. Have you noticed any big changes in Pakistan during all these years that you've stayed here? People always ask that and yeah. uh, people expect me to say yes, but I hesitate to say yes because there's so many things from the past that we recognize. Mm. So many, even in some of the shops, we find the same shopkeepers really? that were there 20 years ago. <laughs> and they still remember you? Um, well, we rem <laughs> at least in one of the shops that was the case, maybe okay. two. And, we uh, remember them. All right. <laughs> and I saw my old uh, tailor shop, I didn't go inside, but I saw it was still there. Wow. So uh, many things are similar, the Margala Hills have, have stayed still quite there. similar. Yeah. Maybe the, <laughs> There is a new restaurant, there is some more uh, pathways to walk. Uh, yeah. But uh, of course, some things have changed. It's more built up, the population is double. Mm. There is, uh, although there is less security issues now than there was a few years ago, mm -hmm. there is more than there was in 1992. Of course, that was a very different time for Pakistan. I think uh, where I often say that I don't know if I'm an old person coming to a new city or a new person coming to an old city, yeah. but it's a mix because I feel comfortable because I think I recognize things, and uh, and of course there are many new things. There was no malls, there was no there was no uh, highways and flyovers, but all in all, it still has the same feel of a small town, which I really yeah, like. Yeah, it does. That's so nice. And how long did you stay back then in the 90s here? Well, we stayed, we went uh, away and came back and then went away and then I came back alone. So this is actually my fourth time. And my third. Yeah. yeah. So all together, putting it together, maybe seven, seven years, something seven like Seven years. And now, when did you come back? For this time, I came or? back three months ago. We, we came back to we came back together. It's hmm. so it hasn't been that long. Not this time, no. Yeah. <laughs> Was it like a choice to come back, or you just got posted here? Yeah, I'm here to fill in between two long-term uh, coordinators. So I was asked specifically to come here okay. because I knew I worked here before, uh, because I had a certain profile in, in my, my background and on what kind of things I've been doing in the past. Uh, but I welcomed it very much when the, uh, when the option was there on the table, I took it immediately. Uh, and then uh, normally for a short term assignment, uh, they would not, uh, I would, we would not travel with family members, we would mm. travel alone. Yeah. But in this case, uh, uh, we had such good memories from here that That's uh, amazing. I think you wanted to come. I definitely wanted to come when I heard we were going back to Pakistan. It's like, yay. Really? And our daughters also, you're going back to Pakistan, can we come? Sadly, they can't because they're working and they're going to yeah. school, but uh, we were all excited, yeah. Yeah. What is it about Pakistan that made it such a nice surprise to be able to come back here? I think it's because we spent so long time here. Mm. I mean, for my oldest daughter, she, she, for a long time she said, I am from Norway and Pakistan, because oh, she really? lived here for seven yeah. years. So I think it's all, it's all that accumulation of memories. You mm -hmm. know, there, there were hardships, sure, uh, but there were also mostly good times. And yeah. I think that is because, because we had this long time and because people are so incredibly friendly and that hasn't changed. Yeah, exactly. That's so nice. Um, and how long are you planning on staying this time around? How long is it going to be? We, we will leave early next year. It's, okay, um, so yeah, it's a short right, term. Very, very early next year. It yeah. depends on when the government clears the next long-term person, which I expect will be soon. And then there will be some administrative uh, mobilization time. Mm -hmm. And then we're off to the next uh, place, which we don't know what is yet, but uh, it's exciting <laughs> to, uh, to look for various opportunities. How would you describe your time in Pakistan? Has it been an easy country to live in? 
Yeah. You go first. No. <laughs> um, we love the country. It's, uh, it's a, I would say yes, it's an easy country to live in. It's uh, easy to get around. Uh, at the moment, security is good. Uh, yeah. the, uh, there is some restrictions on applying for travel when mm. you go to some places, yeah. which can be uh, sometimes cause delays. But we managed uh, the few months we were here uh, to go to Lahore. Uh, I've been there several times, then to Peshawar. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and also a, a few trips up to the hills. Okay. Uh, we climbed the Mukshpuri on my birthday a month ago, which was oh, the wow. best way to celebrate your birthday. Yeah, that's yeah, such a that pretty nice. place. It really is. Amazing. Yeah. And what about inside Islamabad? Are you still bound by some kind of security restrictions or you can just move around pretty freely here? We've moved... Uh, no, that's there's no Not restrictions inside, on that no. at the moment. The, we lifted the UN had uh, restrictions on family coming here mm. until June this year. Yeah. But it was lifted in June, and now I think more and more families will come and live here, uh, have children going to school, etc. Like we were doing in the past. Yeah. Uh, but it will take time, of course. So those people who are here has to be replaced with people with families, and then exactly. it will go over time. Should we try some of these delicious-looking gulab jamun? <laughs> Are you a fan of Pakistani food? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Too much. Yeah. <laughs> this is one of the, the main risks of Pakistan, that uh, you stay here for three months and you gain five kilos. Yeah, no? That can sometimes happen, yeah. But then, luckily, we have the Margala Hills where you can go hiking. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's yeah, a I, favorite Sunday pasta. Actually. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I managed to join a group hiking last, uh, last weekend. Oh, is and, it? And uh, went from... Um, uh, went uh, <clears throat> from Gola Gali to um, to Pichahawa. Wow, a that's long a long hike. hike. About yeah. 25k. Impressive. Uh, and uh, it's not going too much up and down, but it's uh, such wonderful views. Yeah. And that's one of the good things about Pakistan. Uh, exactly. The mountains, the hills. Uh, we did manage in the past to go up to the nor northern areas. Mm. We haven't managed this time around yet. But that's one of the best memories. We went up to um, to Gilgit, mm -hmm. and we saw the Hunza Valley. It was amazing. Yeah, that's that's really precious memories. Yeah. We brought the kids, and uh, we had wonderful wow. hiking opportunities. Amazing. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about your work specifically here in Pakistan. For those who don't know, what does the UNRCO do here in Pakistan? Yeah, the uh, UN Resident Coordinator is here to bring the UN system together and to bring them together around the Sustainable Development Goals. Mm -hmm. This is one, I think, uh, one of the successful things about reforming the UN system, which has actually worked over the last, uh, uh, it's almost two decades now we had the MDGs and then the Sustainable Development Goals and it brings the, everybody together, not only the UN system but the countries that we work towards the same goals and we, not only the uh, official DOM but also private sector and so on are participating trying to make the Sustainable Development Goals happen. It's 17 goals yeah. covering all sectors. Uh, many different aspects and we have in Pakistan 20 UN agencies yeah. trying to deliver on this, deliver with their various expertise in the various parts of the country and there is a lot of knots and bolts, a lot of moving parts and my job is trying to get this to pull together for the benefit of all Pakistanis, for, uh, for the major um, issues of Pakistan, particularly for the Sustainable Development Goals. And what are your responsibilities in particular? I, I convene the agencies, I negotiate with the government, I receive ideas, try to develop ideas into something that we can, uh, can do. For example, we have dialogue with the ESAS program, okay. which is trying to expand their work in social protection, reaching, reaching the grassroots, mm. etc. The ESAS program has recently received a, a grant from the Gates Foundation, mm -hmm. so they can deliver more programs. But uh, we believe that the UN system has a lot to contribute to, uh, to offer our expertise in uh, uh, how things can be done, uh, technical assistance in these various areas that, uh, that um, they work in. Hmm. That's one area. Uh, another example maybe is um, in the... Um, so, so I, 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 neg I take part in negotiating this, trying to get agencies involved in mm. then delivering on that. And then another example would be 
In the Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, we have the newly merged districts, the former Fata region. Yes. Uh, there is a number of uh, development issues there. There is also the displacement of people, people mm. supposed to come back after the conflict that were there a few years ago. Mm. And um, we have uh, several programs trying to, to deliver on that. But people obviously do not have needs in only one particular sector, not only in health, not only in agriculture. One family would have needs in all sectors. So we try to formulate programs that have a more holistic approach to what people need. And that that requires bringing agencies together, and that's part of my job to, to do that. All right, I see. And how does the resident coordinator work within the different UN organizations and with the host country, the government? Yeah, we the, the uh, resident coordinator works with the agencies to negotiate with the host country to uh, uh, come discuss new programs, mm. to discuss needs, sometimes to solve problems uh, as a group, uh, or I try to do it on behalf of the system. Sometimes uh, with agencies, the agencies do the job. I, I don't do implementation. Mm. I, I don't contract uh, people to deliver specific services on the ground. I try to facilitate, I try to, based on my knowledge of what agencies can do, try to bring them together and, and try to negotiate something meaningful where what we can offer matches what needs there are in, in Pakistan for, for how we can help. Obviously, the, uh, in development, it's the, the people themselves, it's the host communities to, who do the actual development. So what we can do is to help facilitate that, help bring ideas, help uh, support a national development process, uh, bring uh, expertise from outside when you need to find new ways of doing things. Mm -hmm. But the main purpose is to help people themselves do their own development action. Okay. So there's a big presence of UN agencies here in Pakistan. What are some of the key areas where they are contributing? Yes, as you said, there is a big presence mm. and that means we work uh, across many sectors. The, for the 17 SDGs is at the core, the um, Pakistan uh, Development Plan for 2025 is, is, at, is at the core. Uh, but obviously we work in those areas where we can make a difference. Yeah. Uh, agriculture is one, agriculture is extremely important for, for uh, Pakistan. Yeah. Uh, we have uh, economic sector activities, uh, trying to help alleviate poverty, uh, working against inequality, uh, about uh, gender issues, gender violence, uh, gender uh, equality. Um, we work in the social sector. We have uh, large activities in health and education, for example. Mm. There has been in uh, Pakistan, unfortunately, over the last uh, 10, 15 years, several big natural disasters. Yes. There was the earthquake in 2005, mm. the floods 2010, displacement. There was recently an earthquake in Vipur in, in Kashmir. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So we have engaged in, uh, in a large way in trying to deliver humanitarian assistance mm. after, after this. And we are not finished with that. The drought in Sindh and Balochistan, we are still delivering some assistance and mm. also in terms of supporting return of the displaced in uh, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. We are still working working on that. All right. We are also assisting uh, what we call good governance, capacity building of the government's machinery yeah. to assist uh, uh, putting the government, uh, um, assisting the government to be in a better position to deliver services. All right. And how do you see Pakistan's contributions to the UN system? And Pakistan is one of the early member states. I think it joined just one month after independence in 1947, yeah. uh, 30th September. And uh, it has contributed many things since then. One contribution from Pakistan is on uh, peacekeeping. Yeah. It's one of the That's largest right. peacekeeping uh, soldier contributing countries in the world. Mm. I, mean, I think they have now about 5,000 soldiers serving in various UN peacekeeping missions. Pakistan has also been very active in diplomacy in, uh, in the global diplomacy for the, the UN ideals in the uh, G77. 
which is an association of developing countries that has made a big difference in UN policies. Pakistan has been very active and set the, set the stage there. All right. Okay, I think that's enough official talk for now. Should we start moving towards the next restaurant where we're having lunch? Sounds good. Yeah, okay. let's do that. We're going to take a short break. Don't go anywhere. I'll see you soon. Welcome back. I'm here with the UN resident coordinator and his wife, and we're about to just have some lunch here inside Poor Village. Let's go. So you've been traveling the world with the UN for 29 years now. What inspired this lifestyle? Were you both always really adventurous, interested in traveling, seeing different countries? <laughs> Well, Norway is a quite small country, yeah. but this country is a country that where people have an interest in in the world, okay. and uh, you you feel the, the the wish to go out and see see what's outside Norway. People have done it for uh, hundreds of years from yeah. from Norway, you know the Vikings, for exactly. example. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, so that's definitely part of it: the interest to see what's outside and to be part of the bigger world. But another issue is that once you start looking at the bigger world, you see there's a lot of unfairness, there's a lot of things that are wrong, there's a lot of things that needs to be addressed. Mm. And uh, there was also a wish of being part of that, part of the work to improve some of these things. Yeah, sure. And um, where did you two first meet? How did that happen? <laughs> that is... Uh... I'd like to use the term that we fell for each other, literally, okay. because we actually met in a judo club. Oh, no way. We did. <laughs> that's so so funny. that's how we met through that group. We were both students in Trondheim, in Norway. Okay. So you met in Norway? We did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. In college, yeah. Hmm. In the oh. sports club. So a long time ago. Yeah, long time ago. We've been married for quite a few years. Wow. <laughs> and then you just decided, like, okay, like, I'm going to go wherever he goes and continue my career. Well, it didn't happen exactly like that because we were both working, we both finished uh -huh. our studies. I was a journalist, he was actually working in the oil business. Oh, okay, yeah. at that time. Okay. So we lived in Oslo and we uh, had our first child. We were both working in, in stable jobs and then this opportunity came up for Knut to apply to a, um, <coughs> a program within the UN which is called JPO, Junior Professional Office. Oh, yes, yes, that's and still that, going on, I think. And yeah. we thought that was going to be a maximum three-year leave of absence. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not close to 30. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you you wow. get... Um, you get caught up in this lifestyle in a, in a positive way, I'd say. Yeah. The more you work, the more you see what needs to be done. Exactly. And uh, for me, it has been moving on from journalism to uh, creative writing. So I've exactly. sort of brought my portable career with me. Yeah. yeah, well, that's amazing. That's very easy to do, I think. Easier than a lot of spouses. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And you've lived in Afghanistan, in Burma, in Kazakhstan, Iran, so many, Iran. Malaysia, East Timor. <laughs> That's so many countries. I mean, how would you compare those experiences with Pakistan? Is there anything that's been similar or like totally different? Well, do you want to answer, answer to the work part of it? Yeah, well, we, well, we lived in a very small country, Timor-Leste, yeah. or in Fiji, which has uh, about 850,000 people as the total population. Yeah. Or we lived on an island with about 400,000 people. Mm -hmm. So the environment was entirely different. You, you could know everything about uh, all the different places. It's uh, easy to get around. Pakistan is a country of way over 200 million people. Yes. It's uh, big cities, there is some pollution, which there wasn't much in Fiji. Mm, yeah. uh, and Pakistan, but Pakistan has so many dimensions though. It's, uh, it's the cultural, political, economical, the nature dimensions, which can be very, really fascinating. Yeah. Pakistan has so many opportunities and also challenges that yeah. we like to... But that is to. the magic of this lifestyle, right? Every exactly. three to four years you move into a totally different tapestry of 
culture yeah. and food and language and religion and, and that's all these things. And that is fascinating. Yeah. And that is that's the magic of this. Exactly. Have you ever found it challenging though, like that you always have to move to a new country, make new friends, settle down in a new city like every few years? Has that been difficult? That Certainly it's been in it's been challenging. But you you develop some techniques after you've done it a few mm -hmm. times. I'm really good at packing. Okay. <laughs> and yeah. uh, you learn, for example, now the kids are no longer with us because mm. they've grown up but when we moved the first thing to do was to get them settled in school mm -hmm. and through mm -hmm. school I would always meet other parents and that would be your first line of network yeah uh, for me at least okay. uh, but for the kids of course it's been challenging you know yeah. there, there's been times when we've been thinking wow are we doing the right thing mm. they have had a lot of goodbyes to friends but they've also made a lot of friends and the beauty now when they are grown up is to see that they actually have friends all over the world and they have okay. made close close friendships that they maintain over geographical borders. Exactly. And they've probably learned a lot of languages as well. They have, they speak quite a few languages, yeah. yeah. That's incredible. Okay. Uh, for example, in my, uh, our oldest daughter's wedding, maybe two of her best friends who were there were from Kazakhstan and Pakistan. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's so in, sweet. In the wedding in Norway. Yeah, great. And when you first came to Pakistan, what did you think about the country? Like, do you have time to find out a lot of information about the country that you move on to next? Or is it just like, okay, let's go and see what it's like? I didn't know a lot before I came, yeah. I have to say. I just had to read up as quickly as I could. Yeah. But um, I think the first impression was that it's very, very different from anything else. Yeah. It felt a bit overwhelming, mm -hmm. lots of people. Mm -hmm. And uh, but we also immediately met, you know, kindness, kindness and helpfulness, which is one of my favorite Pakistan stories. Is once I had a, a car, my car stopped. I don't remember if it was gas or whatever. It stopped, and I wasn't able to get it all the way to the side. And immediately, I was surrounded by people asking, "Can I help? Can I help?" And what literally happened? They more or less they lifted the car, like no the way. ten, twenty people <laughs> lifted the car into the side so that I get out of the way. Where no. else would that happen? Exactly. That's that's a very a uh, typical Pakistani story. Isn't it? I hear Isn't that it? all the time, like people getting stranded Rushing somewhere. In, wanting and so to help. helpful. Yeah. Amazing. Mm. And um, so, yeah, you mentioned you have a big Pakistani community. Did you have any Pakistani friends? Did you know any Pakistanis back home? No, Nothing? not at all. Yeah. But that is also partly because we live outside Oslo, of course, and the yeah. biggest community is in Oslo it's itself. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. it's 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 well, you know, it's it's well integrated. It's like mm. it's a very very common sight in Norway. Pakistani dresses, Pakistani. Oh. Yeah. So food, parks on the well. stores, shops. So yeah. it wasn't that unknown, like it wasn't like completely unknown territory for you when you came here. You had a bit of an idea. Then. Had a bit of an idea, but yeah. mostly what I've read and you know yeah. And watched. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's great. So you can read a lot about the country before you come and talk to people, but you can really only get to know the country once you are there. Exactly. And that's what we have normally done. Yeah. Uh, we have tried to move around, visit different places, do some tourism, or to get to know some of the cultural issues. Sometimes try to learn the language, but I'm very bad with languages. So I have to admit, I, I don't speak. Uh, and we, had, we have also introduced Pakistan to many of our friends. Over okay. the years we've lived here, we've had a lot of visitors from really? Norway. Is everybody, it? Yeah, everybody traveling in. Did they like oh, it here? Absolutely. Oh, wow. This was not this time, we've only lived here a few months now, but in mm. earlier years, wow. yeah, that was a great That's experience, great. traveling with them and, yeah. yeah. Uh, does Pakistan ever remind you of Norway? Like I'm thinking in like in particular the northern areas because Norway obviously has a lot of mountains. Does it look at all similar to you? More impressive here actually. Oh yeah? We are very proud of our mountains. Of we course. think they are, you know, <laughs> the greatest and tallest and, and most wondrous in the world. And when yeah. I came here I realized, wow, they flatten us. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well that's that's amazing. I mean, especially if you've had your friends come here, like and they've had such amazing experiences here. So I'm sure that's that's helping, you know, maybe promote a different image of the country in Norway as well. Yeah. well it was a very interesting trip when we brought my parents up to the Khyber Pass. Really? Um, Back in the 90s. Yes, yeah. 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 With, that was with our six months old daughter or something, yeah, something like, like that. Up to the Khyber Pass. That was, we have some great pictures from that time. <laughs> it's a wonderful place. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. very beautiful, but now I guess it's not possible to travel so there easy because now. of the security reasons. Mm. But yeah, amazing. Should we move to the restaurant? Yep. Let's do it. So where are 
are you both from in Norway? Uh, I come from a small town called Steinskjær. It's about two hours north of Trondheim, which is the mid part of Norway. Okay. Well, what is it like there? Is it? It's like a smaller. It's a small town where I grew up, and I lived there until I finished high school. Then moving to Trondheim, which is the closest, you know, big town, to go to college, and that's where we met. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I'm from uh, an agricultural area in the southeast, just two hours north of Oslo, a small town called Hamar. Yeah. So I also studied in Trondheim. So we That's met where there. you met, yeah. And then you moved to Oslo at a later stage. Yeah. So I was interested to find out more about this um, Pakistani community that lives in Norway. I mean, it seems like a very far away, cold country for Pakistanis to move to and Pakistanis don't speak Norwegian. What inspired the Pakistani community to move to Norway in particular? Do you have any idea about that? I'm not sure, but I heard some stories. Yeah. Um, for sure, it had to do with the Norwegian economy uh -huh. uh, booming after the uh, oil started to flow in 1971 in okay. Norway, that uh, the economy became suddenly much much better. It was a great growth, a great need mm. for, uh, for uh, labor. And there were already many Pakistanis coming to the UK. And UK and Norway are not so far away. I, well, the story I heard was that there was a group of Pakistanis who were supposed to travel to uh, UK and by a coincidence ended up in Norway. Okay. And then they liked it there. Yeah. And then they invited their friends and, uh, and relatives. Uh, and then uh, for a while there was, uh, I think, a big growth. There was at some point in Norway a stop in regular immigration. Mm -hmm. So then after a certain point of time, there was only refugees okay. or special cases or family reunions for oh, Pakistanis okay. to come, come to Norway. I see. And I'm sure there are still a lot of links between the countries, like many Norwegians must be, I mean, pa Norwegians of Pakistani origin, they must be still coming back to Pakistan and I'm sure there's a lot of travel back and forth between the countries still. Yeah, I think there is. Yeah, there and, is uh, yeah. I think we, we happen to know, um, uh, well, basically the son of uh, a Pakistani um, businessman who, who started a, a business in Norway selling rugs. Oh, okay. And rugs made in Pakistan. Uh, but then he took it up on himself to use that business opportunity to also improve living conditions for the people uh, where he came from Ooh. here in Pakistan and, uh, and they uh, improved the working conditions in the factory, they improved uh, uh, the living conditions for the family, they established a school for oh, children wow. of people working in this, oh, uh, nice. this factory uh, and I think they have done a lot of good through, through this opportunity and I, and I think uh, this, there are probably several families like that traveling, traveling back and forth. Yeah, great. And I wanted to ask you in particular, because you know, um, resident coordinator, that's the senior most rank in the UN system of a country. How long did it take for you to get to start working in this position? How many years did you have to work within the UN system? I started, uh, I worked in the oil business first, and then yeah. I had this interest in the area of, of development. And mm. uh, in 1990, I found a, a position, a temporary position that I can start working in, which was a relatively junior yeah. position. And uh, in 2006, so 16 years later, I had my first uh, resident coordinator okay. post uh, after having gone through several steps in, in, in many countries. Did you always have this interest towards humanitarian issues or it came late, at a later stage from somewhere? I think for a long time. I, I remember thinking about some sort of humanitarian work already in, in high school, mm -hmm. uh, but it didn't become like that in the beginning. But uh, eventually I started thinking more about it mm. and realizing more and more that uh, we do we do have a common responsibility yeah. in, in the human race to try to improve conditions for, for our fellow human beings. Exactly. And, and there's so much to be done, and I wanted to be part of that. Yeah. yeah. Could you ever have imagined, either one of you, that you would one day be sitting here in Islamabad? <laughs> Absolutely no? not, absolutely not. As I said, I come from a very small town and when I grew up, I hardly knew where Pakistan was. Exactly. So I could never have imagined yeah. this. Life is so unpredictable. <laughs> yes, and uh, what I have realized over the years is that there are 
many more places that I will ever be able to visit or understand. Mm. Of it's, uh, I think to properly understand the country, you have to be born there or be there more than 20 years. So we who are visiting for a few years, we, we can scratch the surface, we can pick up on some of the important issues, we can work with good partners in the country to, to try to achieve something when they take the lead. Um, but there is so much more, there's always so much more to learn exactly. about these, these countries. And one of the most important things that I have learned in this, uh, this time is that, uh, and it sounds so simple, is that there is more than one way to do things right. Hmm. I think this is something back home or maybe in any place where people live and work all their life, they think things must be done in a certain way, otherwise it's wrong. Okay. But yeah. then I have lived through, people do these kind of things in a different way, and it's also right. Okay. And it sounds extremely simple, but if you, if you think about it and try to apply it on your worldview, I think you, you realize how much diversity can, can enrich what we do. Absolutely. It's time to take a short break. I'll see you when we come back. Welcome back. I'm here in conversation with the UN resident coordinator and his wife, Anne. So now we've been talking a lot about your work, but I wanted to ask you, Anne, um, you, you are now an author of around 12 novels, is That's that right. correct? And before that, you worked as a journalist. I did, yeah. How did you get started? Is this what you studied? You studied journalism and then... I did. I always knew that I wanted to write. I mean, that, that was... Yeah. That was what I wanted to do, but you know, in the small town that I came from, you couldn't really voice the wish to be an author. That sounded so grand, and, and so I, you know, I thought, what can I do to write for a living? And and I studied journalism mm. in college, and that's what I, that's the road I took. And I worked as a journalist for I think it was about eleven years before mm -hmm. we started moving. Okay. And uh, covering then of course, like um, covering Norway. everything, news. Yeah. I mean, traffic as accidents, sports events, shop openings, court so, cases, everything. Everything. Wow. Um, yeah. But when we started moving, especially as we had, you know, we had three kids after a little while, it wasn't possible to keep up. Uh, a steady career as a freelance journalist. Mm. Also, there is a limit to how many articles from Kazakhstan and Norwegian newspaper once exactly. every year, right? <laughs> so, uh, so I just, um, I sort of got into creative writing by chance. I saw an ad for a uh, from one of the biggest publishing houses in Norway for mm -hmm. um, young adult novel. They wanted, I think it was five chapters and a synopsis. So I set to work and I and I wrote that and I, I, I won that contest. So that was how my first novel was published. Great. And after that I have been yeah, writing 11 more. <laughs> wow. And where do you get your inspiration from in the books? You know, um, to me, it's not, it's not so much about this divine inspiration, not when I pick my, my themes and not when I do the work. I think I benefit a lot from having been a journalist because it is work, yes. right? Yeah. Just, you don't feel inspired every day. You just yeah. sit down and you do the work. Exactly. So, yeah, <laughs> I'm you sure you know that. to write, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> but the, the, the topics, the themes is always what comes first. I always yeah. have a theme I want to write about. Could be, I've written about trafficking, I've written about child marriage, I've written about women aging, and I have the topic first, then I sort of figure out the setting and the story okay. and the characters. But the settings, that's important. The settings are always places that I know. Yeah. I don't, I'm sure as a journalist you know that there's always a, a reader or a viewer who will catch you if you make a mistake. Exactly. So if I write, I couldn't write a book from Egypt because I've never been to Egypt, right? But I have had Pakistan as a setting, I've had Kazakhstan, you know, these places that I know I can describe the smell in the market, the taste of the food, the sound of the language. Yeah. So in that, in that way, this moving around has been providing wonderful settings for my books. Should we dig in? Yeah. Looks delicious. Looks delicious, yeah. So we have, I think, biryani. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, that's biryani. Mm, that's wonderful. That's enough. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for serving. Thank you. 
was one of the things we were, sorry? sorry, that was one of the things we looked forward to coming back to was yeah. the Pakistani food. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Is, um, do you eat mostly Pakistani food at home or? You mean here? Mix? Yes. Uh, some days, not always, but some days, yeah. Yeah. Just some days you get the craving for a good curry. Yeah. Do you want some naan maybe? Well, well, <laughs> maybe we can share a piece. Strongly yeah. naan. Can, can we just share All a right. piece? There's something. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank this you. Is, I think some Ah, chicken. some chicken, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Try this one. So I think Pakistani Pakistani food is quite different from Norwegian food. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. What do you usually eat in Norway? We eat a lot of fish, um, but I think shamefully, I think the Norwegian national dish these days is taco. Taco night has is become it? something in Norway. That's but I think it's, it's a very Norwegian way. Unexpected. <laughs> For many years, it was the it was the pizza. I think uh -huh. we like to adopt the foreign trends, but for you know, for like traditional traditional food will never disappear. I mean, we have you need to have this for Christmas. You need to have this for uh, for example in the in the fall we eat um, mutton, and these things uh -huh. will never disappear. I think, but yeah. I think we're be we become more adventurous in food. Okay. <laughs> uh, sorry, what? Oh yes, sorry. Yeah. So let's try. Let's try some of this. Looks delicious. Looks absolutely delicious. Mmm. Mmm. I'm using this on the salad before I, before I put it in my mouth. No, without the Pakistani food, we were um, we're not that good at cooking this ourselves. Maybe oh, yeah? the curries. <laughs> I think the curries. And, and the biryani requires a particular type of art. And, it does, yeah. And the bread is one of the most attractive things. There's so mm. many different types of bread. Yeah. And it always has to be fresh, freshly made, mm. right? Mm. <laughs> but yeah, to go back to your writing work, uh, you mentioned that Pakistan was a setting for one of your novels. What, what was it about? Mm. It's actually a trilogy for young adults. Oh. That, um, remember I mentioned that I won this contest and you, I, I, had to, um, I had to show a synopsis for the rest of the book. Well, it turned out that the synopsis was so <laughs> comprehensive and so long that it, ended up, it couldn't all fit in one novel. So it ended up being a trilogy. Oh. And in the beginning and the first book of that trilogy, the protagonist moves to Pakistan. And so the next two books takes place there. But the protagonist is from Norway. I wanted to show the contrast between youth culture in different countries. Oh, wow. So I have her go home, like my own kids did, yeah. and sort of see the, the culture at home, see the schools at home, how it compares to her own situation in Pakistan. So, so those, yeah, say two and a half books are set in Pakistan. That's so fascinating. Is it in Islamabad or? Yes, because as I said, I only write the settings I know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Are you working on anything right now? I am, I am. A um, little bit hesitant to talk about it. It's almost okay. like you don't want to jinx it, <laughs> but, but I'm always working on something. Yeah. So, so a new novel in the yes. works. Yes. That's amazing. That's going to be the 13th now then. I hope so. Yeah. Uh, you never feel sure until you've done it, but yeah. um, I'll try. And you're also a fan of Pakistani literature. Who are some of your favorite authors? Oh, that would have to be Mohsin Hamid. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, he's amazing. Really. I, um, I, uh, I've always been part of a book club wherever we've lived. So I think it was in a book club in Iran that we read The Reluctant Fundamentalist. Mm. I don't know if you read that. Yes, I, and I just thought, wow, what an author. Mm. Then I went back and I read Moth Smoke. And the last one, uh, Exit West, mm -hmm. read last year. So a huge fan, huge fan. But it was actually quite amazing. Last year, our oldest daughter is a professor of literature and she works at a college in the US. Okay. And she got the opportunity to interview him. He was, wow. yeah, he was visiting the college and since she was half Pakistani, she was selected to interview him. And we were very proud, but That's it's- incredible. And I'm also a fan of, um, uh, this is a new guy, new to me, Daniel Muaddin. Muaddin. Yes. I read his uh, his uh, short story collection. Yes. Very very good writer. Very talented. Yes. And of course, of course, you know you cannot read about Pakistan without reading a case of exploding mangoes. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Mohammed Hanif. So yeah, I have quite a few favorites. Wow. And you've visited some literature festivals here as well. I have been 
only to the Islamabad one because okay. I came too late for the Lahore one. It's in the spring, mm -hmm. right? And we only yeah. came in September. So uh, so I was not there. I was only there as audience at the, okay. the Islamabad one. Yeah. I only heard about it the night before, actually. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. yeah. But I was recently in Dhaka in the literature to take part there, but that was in Bangladesh. So, yeah. But hopefully I'll get to the Lahore one one day. I've heard it's excellent. Yeah. Okay. Um, and you mentioned that you've gone to travel quite a bit here and recently you visited the Kartarpur opening ceremony. How, yes. was, how was that experience? I'm impressed by what the initiative taken by the uh, Pakistani government in, in, in making this, this happen. Mm. Obviously because there is a dispute between India and Pakistan on, on Kashmir. Uh, there is also a need to keep dialogue going and, and cooperate about constructive things, to build bridges and, and, and look for ways to cooperate. I think the two countries have uh, many things to gain from each other by, by cooperating more closely. I think, and then the Kartarpur corridor was a religious initiative, a cultural initiative, where you opened up for bridge building between the two countries. Uh, very symbolic, of course, it's very, in, in principle, is very specific to the Sikh community. Uh, yes. And uh, this is a, 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 a specific travel destination for, for Sikh pilgrims. Um, but the, the symbolism on having a religious understanding, having cultural understanding, having a dialogue that leads to an agreement about something like this, I, I think it's it's very important for building and, and moving on to other things. Absolutely. Did you have a chance to interact with some of the Sikhs who had come from India when you were at the opening ceremony? Very brief. We were sitting all together in an audience yes. of thousands of people and then there were several interventions including from the Prime Minister there. Mm. Uh, so we had a few words with the people. Yeah. Uh, who, were, who were there and they appreciated it very much. To, it was also the former Indian Prime Minister Manmohan Singh. Yes, he, he came. was also there. I didn't have a chance to talk to him, but, but yeah. he was there. I think that was uh, also very important for, for having the uh, more bilateral understanding, more chances for bilateral dialogue. Yeah, great. And um, what would you say has been your favorite trip in Pakistan? Like maybe doesn't have to be official trip, maybe even just an unofficial trip as well. Yeah, I'm. I, I would have to say, maybe uh, going up to Hunza. Yeah, that was. Your I was favorite. hoping you would say that. <laughs> yes, I think Absolutely. it's a very special yeah. place. It's. Uh, it has a lot of legends around it, oh, and yeah. I think there's a good reason for that. The landscape out there, up there, is magnificent. Mm. It. Um, has uh, a number of cultural aspects and also shows you how how people from the really old days were able to to live in a very harsh climate, uh, difficult to, to access uh, area, uh, and really uh, made a good living out of, out of what was there. Yeah. Did you fly up there or you went by road? <laughs> we drove. We drove. Uh, okay. We drove wow. up. But uh, when we went to Hunza, we drove our own cars. Oh, and, uh, wow. We were a whole group of, oh, I think, amazing. five, six cars. We were driving up, and um, some of my friends went all the way to the Chinese border, but I, I didn't. Uh, we had children, so it was a bit far. Yeah. Um, so uh, another time, we went up by by bus, and no. uh, oh, that time with the mudslide. Yes. Yeah, we were stopped by a mudslide oh, no. uh, up there mm. on the highway. Uh, and I think that's not so unusual. Yeah, that happens sometimes yeah. on these roads. <laughs> How many hours did it take for you to get there? I don't remember. I remember it took 12 hours to Gilgit. Okay. But I can't remember how much longer from Gilgit. It was yeah. a few hours more. But the scenery is so amazing. Mm. It's totally worth it, I think. I remember the, the, remember the fruit trees blossoming. And then we saw people drying, like, I don't know what it was. They were drying things up on the, up on the flat roots. Mm -hmm. Yeah, probably Maybe some sort of vegetables or fruit. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It was uh, it was quite amazing. And what about your children? Are they planning on coming back to Pakistan to visit you at some I point? I think they were really hoping to come this time. It depends on how long we stay. If we stay long enough for them to, I mean, two are working and one is a student, so they can't just take off in the middle of the of course, semester. Yeah. But I know they very, very much want to come. Yeah. And they still have friends here? 
Well, as I said or mentioned earlier, um, one of my oldest daughter's best best friend is a Pakistani yeah, exactly. girl from Islamabad. Yeah. That was delicious. <laughs> it was wonderful. Great. Um, so, how do you see, how do you see the future of Pakistan now? Where do you see the country in, let's say, 20 years? I think the the government is taking hold of a number of important things, like um, the economy, trying to deal with uh, social inequalities mm. Mm. and um, and the social sector. It's um, Pakistan can do a lot to develop agriculture further, to develop uh, industries further. Um, it is in a very strategic location, of course, uh, between China and India, and Afghanistan, Iran, and um, it, that neighborhood needs to be managed, I'm, I'm sure. Um, I'm having worked in Afghanistan, I'm worried that there is still not full peace in mm. Afghanistan. Yeah. And I hope that Pakistan can contribute to a future stable and peaceful Afghanistan. And, uh, and I hope also we can have more cooperation in the region. Um, China has this uh, new initiative with the Belt and Road Initiative going not only to Pakistan, but to, to many countries in the region. And I think uh, there are people who criticize this, but there are also great opportunities in, in the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, I think uh, if this is done right, it can also be uh, a great benefit to, to Pakistan. Right. So now it's finally time for our rapid fire round. Are you ready? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Shalwar kameez or jeans? Shalwar kameez on Friday. OK. <laughs> Lahore or Karachi? Lahore. Okay. Pakoras or chaat? Pakora. All right. Mot smoke or the reluctant fundamentalist? The reluctant fundamentalist. Okay. <laughs> uh, Bergen or Stavanger? Bergen. Mm -hmm. That's what I recommended to one of my friends from Samoa when he visited Norway for oh, the wow. first time. That's right. They went to Bergen, mm -hmm. yeah? Great. Farikal or Nihari? Ooh. Please? Farikal. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, Pakistani or Norwegian winters? Norwegian winters. Oh, really? Yeah. We love to ski. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, reindeer or Marhor? Reindeer? They're very cute, yeah. <laughs> very Christmassy. Um, what comes to your mind when I say traffic in Pakistan? Oh, the flyovers and the, the motorways that I built around the blue area. I always get confused there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, Pakistani weddings. Enormous, uh, full of uh, friends and relatives from all over. Henna. Henna? Yeah, Mehendi. Great. Um, Islamabad. Very organized, safe place to live. Comfortable place to live. Beautiful. Great. Uh, Margala Hills or the hills surrounding Oslo? I think I'd say Margala Hills because yeah. you can use them pretty much all year, yeah? All right. The best thing about Pakistan? Oh. The uh, openness among people, the, mm. the friendliness, how they're welcoming mm. people like us. Oh, it, that's right. Always open, always ready to help, always ready to be there for you. Oh, yeah. that's so nice. Then it is time for you to sign our visitor's book. Let me just open it for you. So you can write your comments and yeah. your name. Oh, I'm starting. Let's see what you wrote, Anne. Grateful to be back here for the third time. And then Knut, um, thanks for being part of our homecoming to Pakistan. 
Thank you so much for being on the show. I had a lovely afternoon with you and I hope you continue to have a great time in Pakistan. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. That's it for today. Please join me again next week and don't forget to follow us on our social media handles at indus.news. Goodbye.